I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to yell at you for two hours to get you to understand what I feel. I was like, I'm fantastic. So, so nice to be here. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you are. So we have come across each other on TikTok, which yeah, is we have. my favorite platform for awesome people now. Me too. Yes. I'm obsessed. So your your handle on TikTok is underscore stronger underscore than underscore before. Yes. And you talk all about relationships and particularly about escaping toxic relationships. Correct. What brought you to this? Ooh, big question. So I was, I was in a toxic marriage uh, together for uh, nine years and married for five. And I didn't really even understand that it was toxic, that it was abusive. I really didn't know because it wasn't at first physical abuse. And I think that's something that a lot of people just don't know about. And we find ourselves in these relationships that aren't great um, and we minimize and we sort of uh, sweep it under the rug and pretend that it's not that bad. Um, so I sort of stumbled upon uh, creating my own TikTok account and just sharing my own experience really. Yeah. And you are a professional in this field now. I am. Yes. So I, uh, it sort of led into becoming a, a certified relationship coach and working with a lot of clients on escaping those toxic relationships, um, particularly the relationships that aren't savable because there is abuse happening. But I also work with couples where there is not abuse happening, but toxic behaviors that I think if left um, as is, could create a really bad situation for both parties. So helping couples work together to do better, as well as my primary focus on escaping the trauma bond. Yeah. How long have you been doing this for? Um, all of this year, actually. It started in January of this year. So we're looking at nine months now, but it's been an incredible ride. I've learned uh, so, so much. And um, I've met some amazing people and have some fantastic clients and you know, TikTok uh, surprisingly has become such a big part of my life because that's my my primary um, my primary source of where I share my information is TikTok. Yeah, I love TikTok. I Me do. Too. Like it's yeah. so rewarding. It is. I know. I totally agree. The comments and just you know the participation, the enthusiasm, and engagement from people is phenomenal. Yeah, and it's such an educational platform. And you wouldn't have thought so. I certainly didn't really see that when I first signed up for TikTok. Um, I thought it was just kind of a way to pass the time during COVID, which is, I think, what a lot of people did. Um, but then I found all these amazing people. And I don't remember how long I've been following your account, but like months and months and months. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's such a, a great account. I love the whole concept of no more assholes. I think like what a great, what a great message that, you know, is a, a joke, but so true. Mm, we not don't a joke. Want assholes. Yeah. Like, no like, more assholes. <laughs> literally not a joke. This was a moment. Um, this title was the words that came out of my mouth in a moment of frustration because it was the wrong one and the wrong one and the wrong one and the wrong one. And then one more fucking gaslighter. And I went, and Lisa, how old are you? I am 38 this week. Do you remember when phones were on a wall? Absolutely. Yeah, right? I do. <laughs> and I, I was on the phone with him and I slammed the phone on, like I hung up on him. Remember when you, used to, when you could hang up a phone with power? Hard. Yes. Oh, I yeah. <laughs> I, I hung that. up with power and I went, no more assholes. And it was a moment. And I know a lot of us have said that, like talking to friends, like, oh, I'm so done with assholes, right? Mm -hmm. So not a joke. It's, 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 it was a truthful moment to me. It was a changing moment for me. I have a question about one of your TikToks. Yes. I saw your mama said that it was okay TikTok. Yes. 
And I've, I've seen people do this trend where, you know, it says like, who said you could get into a healthy relationship or who said you could fix your own mental health. And then they'll show like a professional that they see on TikTok. I had somebody do one with me. Um, who said you, you could be happy in a relationship? Mom said, and I'm like, oh my God, that's me. It was so adorable. And you showed your mom. Mm-hmm. I and know. I thought that was so powerful. And I want to know, when did your mom start looking at you in your relationship? Like, did she start saying anything like, this isn't okay, you can do better? You know, it's my mother, she is not a person who will involve herself um, in, in her daughter's relationships without really being asked to, or there being something um, alarming. And in her defense, I hid what was really happening. And I, I downplayed um, the, the abuse, mainly because I didn't know it was abuse. Um, again, it wasn't physical until towards the end when it became obvious. But for the first, you know, seven years, it was gaslighting, manipulation, coercive control, things I hadn't really heard of. I mean, I've obviously, we've all heard of manipulation, but I didn't I didn't really realize how serious it was. Therefore, she didn't. Um, that said, there were definitely a lot of um, comments that she made that were sort of, you know, well, if you if you have to come to the family thing alone, then, you know, I guess I understand. And it was it was little things like that that made me realize she does see that I'm alone a lot. She sees what's happening. And, you know, my whole life, she has always taught my sister and I my mom has two daughters, um, always taught us both that self-love matters and that you really need to focus on yourself and you can only control your own emotions, your own feelings. And, you know, a big thing in relationships for her was always picking your battles. And a, a sort of, I guess, a joke that she made was if he leaves his socks on the floor, are you going to break up with him over that? Yes or no, whatever the answer is. But if you're not going to end it over the thing, then just ignore that thing. But if it's a deal breaker, then really decide, do you want to be with this person or not? Um, And I, I honestly, I didn't take her advice. She's, she has said it my whole life. Um, I just didn't take her advice until it really hit me. So figuratively and really what, so I, I, I want to say it this way. I don't know if this is the right way to say it. What made you weak in this situation? Uh, my personal belief on that is is actually a lack of self love. I think um, my mother taught us that, and it somehow didn't stick with me. Interestingly enough, my sister and I, uh, other than we have a very similar voice, we are completely night and day. My sister is a you know don't put up with any shit ever. Um, She's all about herself and not in a selfish way. She's a very generous, loving person, but she's like, I matter. And I'm not going to be with someone who doesn't make me feel like I don't matter. And she had a, uh, a fun childhood, a fun teenage years, uh, party, party. And then she met someone at 18 and she moved across the country to be with him. And I frankly thought, you know, you'll be back in six weeks. Uh, It's been 21 years and she's still there madly in love and her husband is fantastic. So she's doing something right. And we are, we have the same parents, the same upbringing. And for some reason that self-love didn't quite stick with me the way that it did with her. And I'm more of a people pleaser. I have um, less so now, of course, but I struggled to say how I felt when it comes to personal relationships. Professionally, I was a different person. Professionally, I will tell you exactly what I think. Um, I've held senior executive positions um, and been in charge of teams and, you know, upwards of $30 million a year in my career. But for some reason, personally, I could not express what I wanted and I would just kind of take what was given. Hmm. I have a client who, um, you know, for, for her, the, the, the person in her life that kind of uh, was a backtrack in terms of her evolution and self-love and emotional growth was a teacher. When she was young, there was a teacher that would like used her as a lightning rod basically, and constantly criticized her and constantly told her that she wasn't good enough and everything she did was wrong. Do you think there's anybody, you know, because, you know, like, it sounds like you came from a very loving, supportive household. 
Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that one, because maybe that was that was that point. Oh, I don't know if I, I my internet connection goes in and out a little bit sometimes. So is there any is there any person in your life, maybe at a young age during your formative years, that was overly critical of you that could have like, you know, that made sort of made that difference between you and your sister, like maybe she didn't have somebody in her life that was overly critical, but you did. And it sort of tore away at you just a little bit or a lot? Um, I have, I have considered that deeply and, uh, both, you know, alone and in therapy. And we honestly didn't, we really had the exact same people in our lives. Um, I know, you know, my mother is a people pleaser herself, despite her self-love teachings. Um, and I, I don't think that she struggles to love herself, but she also, um, due to her own upbringing, hates conflict. Mm -hmm. And for that same reason, as much as, again, professionally, I'm, uh, maybe known as a, in my old life, a bit of a, a bulldozer maybe, or like I was very strong and definitely got called a, a bitch at work more than once in my life, which is unfair, but you know, it happens to women. Oh, it's a compliment. Thank I take you. it as a compliment <laughs> now. Um, I was once called fiercely passionate by someone and he meant it as an insult. And I updated my LinkedIn profile with fiercely passionate as the first thing made me feel good. But, um, but no, I, I think, you know, it's that people pleasing. I watched her please her husband, which was my father. Um, they divorced and she remarried. And I still think that she put him above her. And I think it was just, I just watched that be the case. And even though I saw her not being successful doing it, I still somehow thought the self-love and the confidence and everything applies to this one area of my life, but I could not figure out how to apply it to my personal life. Mm -hmm. It was just, I only learned it honestly within the last 12 months. It's, it's been so difficult. And your platform is taking off like crazy. It is actually. So I, I definitely didn't start TikTok with the intention of it being a business or, you know, even my, my screen name was not a business name. It was just, I felt stronger than before. Mm -hmm. And so I created that more for myself and it was really just part of my own healing. And I, I, I sort of joke, I don't know what made it just sort of take off. Um, I know once I got in the 80,000 range, um, I made a video about the, what I think is just the silliest thing, but it was so relatable and I, I didn't realize it, but it got I think I'm at 4.4 million views on that one video. Um, but the long and short of it was, it was about a trigger of I'm with someone new and he's, he's wonderful. He needed a reminder to do something. And honestly, I don't, I know that's a, a, an interesting topic of having to remind a man to do something because I'm not your mother. I, I'm not the house manager. I shouldn't have to. Um, the backstory is that he had just moved in. So uh, I was reminding him to take out the compost and he was already taking out the garbage. But the thought of having to say, could you also take out the compost? I honestly was standing in the kitchen thinking I, I physically am almost struggling to breathe at the thought of having to ask. He is the kind of person that if I said, could you take out the compost? He would say, sure. Mm -hmm. Simple, super simple. But it's a trigger for me because when I would ask my ex-husband to do anything, it just turned into this massive, you're a nag, you're and just devaluing me so much. So it took a lot to, to ask. And something that I've, I've worked on a lot is asking anyway, regardless of how I feel, regardless of the reaction, because I need it done. Yeah. So it becomes um, something you just have to push through. But in the video, you know, I was sort of reenacting that moment of, uh, anxiety really. And that is a video that really pushed me well over a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Um, I was already taking it seriously as a business prior to that video, but that video pushed me from a, from a following perspective up quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. and it also helped me see some of the content that people want to see in my niche about the anxiety and the triggers, because you can heal from the abuse, but the triggers can sometimes still exist. And if you don't push past those, you end up with another asshole. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. absolutely. And that's that's something I talk about. We seek what's familiar, even if it's wrong for us. It's so easy to sabotage our own growth because it's, it's easier to stay on 
this side of discomfort, the discomfort that comes with familiarity, which is the known discomfort rather than the, the discomfort that comes from growth, which is the unknown. And we have that fear of the unknown that kicks in, which is like a survival instinct, basically, that is now a dysfunction because mm-hmm. our environment has changed faster than our brains have. And so the known territory is I know where the predators are. I know where the food sources are. So going into the unknown creates a distress signal, but there's, we, there's no predators. We know where the food is. So we don't, this, this signal doesn't need to drive our behaviors. Mm -hmm. You describe your ex as a narcissist. Is that right? I do. And what makes you use that word? Um, well, (laughs) I, uh, I actively don't talk about that on TikTok, but I'm happy to answer it. So um, the reality is, is, you know, in, in Canada where, where we live, um, a licensed psychotherapist is not able to diagnose. In the U.S., they can diagnose um, the exact same qualification. So it's really just, you know, a licensing issue. Um, and my therapist, who was our marriage counselor, So she knows him and has direct experience with him. And when we were in sessions, um, he called me a narcissist and she was like, whoa, whoa, let's, let's not do labels. And I took that to mean neither of you are a narcissist. So I sort of put that to bed and I kept wondering like, what is he? Is he bipolar? He can't just be an asshole. I, I refused to accept that he was just an asshole. There had to be something. And I was obsessed with the something because I felt like that would mean that Now I can identify the problem, which means now I can fix the problem so we can stay together. And obviously that's not what happened, but I eventually sort of gave up on that and I moved on from finding out what the problem was. When I reconnected with our marriage counselor to do individual counseling, um, she sort of just said it in passing about him being a narcissist. And I sort of said, well, hold on, stop right there, explain this to me. And she first and foremost explained I have absolutely no qualifications in Canada to diagnose. I'm not diagnosing him, but I believe that he is one. And here's the reasons. And I had already done all this research on it. And when she said it, it was like, I think I was right. Like this, this actually, it is true. It's, and I really, I have spent months reflecting on his behaviors. I, I do believe that people overuse the word narcissist. I really do believe that. Um, Not to the degree that some would say, but, you know, we hear it a lot. My ex is a narcissist. I believe in my core that my ex is a diagnosed or I guess undiagnosed, but actual narcissistic personality disorder. Um, I don't think he has strong tendencies. I think that it's truly the disorder. Um, It's just a lack of accountability, a lack of um, empathy for anyone, anyone. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have kids? We have two kids. Um, they are three and five. So there's still a relationship there, like a co-parenting relationship? Um, no, there is not. Um, and, you know, I mean, depending on who you ask between us, you'd get different stories. But really, you know, I want him to have a relationship with our kids. Um, they'll always be his kids. I think that due to the challenges, due to the abuse, Um, not that he was specifically, he was never physically abusive towards the kids, but he was emotionally abusive towards the kids. And he was physically and emotionally abusive to me in front of the kids, Mm. which is a problem. And, um, so he, you know, we split up last year. Um, he didn't see the kids too much last year over the summer he did, but particularly in the fall started seeing them less, um, I require that he has a supervisor to see the kids, whether that's a paid person or his mother or someone who's a responsible person that we both trust. Mm -hmm. Um, And he just, he doesn't take me up on that. It's a longer story, but he doesn't take me up on that. So it's rare. He does, but he sort of chooses not to, um, which is unfortunate because the kids are sad about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So for women who are in relationships and they're questioning whether or not this is a toxic, abusive relationship for whatever reason, what are the signs they need to be looking for? For me, it's actually really about patterns. So I think, you know, really there's three types of relationships. There's a healthy relationship, a toxic one, and an abusive one. And toxic relationships typically involve two people, one or both could be toxic. 
and they both need to work on things and they're both potentially willing to work on things individually, I mean, and potentially as a couple, but abusive is where one person is being abusive and there's an intention behind it and a real lack of care. Um, Not all abusers are narcissists, but you know, as much as I was obsessed with the label, one thing I learned was that the label means nothing. Mm -hmm. The label doesn't bring you what you think it will bring you. Um, So I, you know, not to play off the name of your book, but I honestly do. It doesn't matter if he's a narcissist. What you know is that he's an asshole. That's kind of all you do need to know and focus on is how are you being treated? Is it a pattern? Is it, is it an ongoing behavior? Have you addressed it? And they're ignoring it willfully ignoring it because that's when it becomes abusive when the intention is that you just don't care how your partner feels it's been communicated to you and you just keep doing that terrible behavior um toxic can be a pattern but there's still a difference in you know it being abuse being i'm trying to hurt you versus toxic is potentially i don't really know that i am hurting you or i don't understand that i am so you know, abuse is something you want to leave. There's no, there's no fixing an abusive partner, man or woman. It's not something that people can go to therapy and then just stop being an abuser. That's typically, I'm sure, you know, not how it works. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how can people address toxic? Um, I think being very strong on your boundaries and deciding what it, what you will put up with. So it really, it starts with you as let's say um, in a, in a straight hetero relationship, it's the woman is the one who's, you know, being, being toxic. How can she look at her behaviors, stand back? I a huge advocate for individual therapy um, to, you know, or coaching, but therapy to really learn about yourself because it helps to have someone else pointed out to you. But what you need to do with that information is reflect And look at the patterns that you are creating um, in a relationship. And men can often get labeled as an abuser if they're toxic. But again, it's that willingness. Mm -hmm. The biggest difference is the willingness. So if you find yourself in a toxic relationship, the best thing you can do is decide what specifically about your partner or about that relationship do you feel is toxic or hurting you? What do you uh, like about the relationship? What are the behaviors that hurt your feelings or make you feel uncomfortable or unhappy and address it. And hopefully then your partner is willing to do something. They don't have to go to therapy necessarily, but are they actively saying, you know, is this okay? And I, I hear you. Can they repeat back to you what you perceive the bad behaviors to be? Um, If you feel like it's a two-way dialogue, that's good. If not, that's a red flag to me that they're not willing to overcome that toxicity. Yes. What do you think of the word ultimatum? I think that um, it is used incorrectly a lot. I think um, when you set a boundary, people say, oh, you're giving me an ultimatum. And honestly, I find it a little bit triggering because my ex-husband would always sort of use that against me as if I, if I asked for anything or else, which is not how I worded it, he, pers- he would hear, be better or I'm leaving. When what I'm saying is I need this in order to be happy, in order to be half of this healthy relationship, I need this from you. And it always was sort of like, well, you're giving me ultimatums and you're always threatening to leave. If it, threatening to leave is like, if you don't pick up your socks, I'm getting a divorce. That's ridiculous. But if you continue to lie, manipulate and gaslight me, I can't be in this relationship anymore is not an ultimatum. So your content really speaks to me from that perspective, because, you know, you you almost want to eye roll a little bit with some of the comments I see that you respond to. And I'm like, (laughs) how do they not get it? How do they not see that it's not an ultimatum? And men and women both can collectively have these boundaries and set them and hold them. And it's up to us to hold and set the boundaries. It's not for the other person. Boundaries are sort of meant to be pushed, but it's up to you to say, I'm firm with this. This is, this is something that matters to me. It's not an ultimatum to say, I don't want to be in a relationship with somebody who seeks the attention of other women. I don't want to be in a relationship with somebody 
who calls me names and raises their voice. Mm-hmm. That's not an ultimatum. It's a standard. This is my standard. And if you continue to choose to be that person, then you are not up to my standard. So it's not an ultimatum. It's an opportunity for you to understand me and apply what you understand about how I choose to be treated. Mm-hmm. And I think that's honestly, I mean, it's simple advice. And yet, you know, really it's it's hard to follow because it feels um, for people pleasers, such as myself, it feels like you are giving an ultimatum. And I think women in particular were sort of trained to be and groomed to be not, uh, not pushing back and not to be aggressive. And we, we all have to do a better job at, at redefining what that means. And, and a woman asking for what makes her happy is not a bad thing. We have been taught that it's not okay to control our own environment right? This pushback against the no kissing for three months dating rule. How dare you set a timeline that gives you an opportunity to get to know somebody? How dare you set the pace? How dare you say, if I don't measure up to what you want, you're going to eliminate me before I can get physically intimate with you. How dare you set an ultimatum, that word being used when we're trying to set a standard and maintain that standard and have boundaries for ourselves. So there Mm -hmm. definitely is a brainwashing conditioning that has been taking place for so long. We don't even know where the message is coming from. Mm -hmm. When I say to women, no kissing for three months, and they say, nobody would wait that long. I say, who told you that they have no answer, but it's that conditioning. It's that brainwashing conditioning that's gone on so long that they think it's their own voice saying that. Right. And it's definitely not. And in all fairness, I don't know that I could answer that question either because it was never said to me directly, but I absolutely thought that you kind of do have to just sort of cater to men a bit. And, you know, I, I know that, you know, there's a range of, of women that some have more, um, more ability to sort of set that boundary and they're not seeking such validation from men, but, you know, y- you feel like you have to behave in a certain way or we do, you just sort of let go and you think, okay, well, he's, he's touching me now. So I guess, I guess that's what's happening. I guess the relationship is moving forward, but did I ever think, did I want that? Did I want to participate in his hand on my leg or did I, did I even want to kiss him? Did I feel it? Kiss on the first date, right? Yeah. If she, if she doesn't kiss on the first date, I'm moving on. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the, the grooming isn't to be um, subservient to men. It's to be subservient to guys, to selfish short-term thinkers And Mm -hmm. men are on the sidelines going, hey, like, how come I can't find anybody? And it's because we as women have been groomed to, you know, not question giving guys what they want when they want it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I love, I love myself now more than I ever have because I'm setting those boundaries. And I mean, I'm in a relationship now, but while I was dating, I'm like, I'm not putting up with assholes. I'm just not. And in fact, I went on a date last year where we had pizza and first date, he made reference to something else being in my mouth on the date, um, other than pizza. And, uh, I mean, check please. Like, I, I honestly was speechless. I, I literally went to the bathroom 10 minutes later and walked out the door. I just, I couldn't even, I I just didn't come back. It it was the most strange thing that had happened to me in my adult life. And I honestly remember thinking like, is this what dating is? Is this what this is now? Is are are men worse than I remember? Or it was dreadful, but yeah, leaving was the right option. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong. Perhaps I should have said I'm leaving, but um, I just walked out. Like there's nothing else to discuss. There's, I don't want to get to know, get to know you at all anymore. Yeah. I always want to bring the language to a recognition of the difference between the selfish short-term thinkers and the generous long-term thinkers. And, uh, you know, I, I want to, I want to change the link. Like there's, I want to change the world, my love, right? Mm -hmm. Like I do, I want women to be empowered. I want them to set the pace. I want them to choose the right men. I want them to be happy, be healthy in their relationships. And when I see people say, you know, men are not good, right? 
men are the one. I'm like, no, 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 guys. It's, it's guys. You're having problems with guys. Men are amazing. And I don't want us to use language that demonizes the good ones out there. And, and, and so I have that distinction because I want women to say to themselves, men are amazing. Uh Guys are what I don't want to play with when I want to commit a long-term relationship Guys are what I'm going to play with if I just want here today, gone tomorrow, have a little bit of fun, fun. Uh Men are amazing because there are so many amazing men out there who are not being seen because we kept getting caught up with guys because guys are so sparkly. Like, was your ex dynamic? Oh, honestly, I mean, I made a TikTok about this a long time ago uh, to make a point, but it, it, uh, my ex honestly is magnetic. He's, he's charming. He is funny. He's charismatic. Everybody likes him. He's the life of the party, the center of attention, like in a good way. Um, if you want to have fun, he is the guy you would call to be like, we want to have a good time today. Call him. Yeah. And he's, he's incredible in so many ways. And I think that's what attracts us to someone like that. Um, in looking at what really attracted me other than the obvious um, of those things is I'm used to a very stable life. Um, my, my mom in particular had a, had a rocky upbringing. So she made us have a very safe and secure life. And I appreciate that so much, but it also made me, I guess, crave some adventure. And, you know, we would wake up on a Sunday morning when we first started dating and he'd be like, you want to go to Canada's wonderland today? And I'm like, like right now, oh my God, that's just so that's the coolest thing, not planning it. And just like, let's just go right now. That's so amazing. And it, it eventually became, I'm, you know, realizing like, oh, that's actually ADHD and he can't plan in advance and everything is flying by the seat of your pants. It became too much, but I can see in the beginning what attracted me to that. It was his sense of fun and his sense of adventure. Um, It was a, you know, a typical relationship start um, to what I now know of an abusive relationship where you, you enter it and it's immediate love bombing and moving in together too fast and saying, I love you in the first three months. And everything was just so fast, but it felt like it happened fast because we were meant to be because we were soulmates and it all just clicked. And I'd never felt that way with anyone else before. Now I know that's, you know, alarm bells left, right, and center. (laughs) And you're in a healthier relationship now. Was this partner as dynamic? Oh, not at all. Right? <laughs> not at all. And, right? uh, you know, my therapist made a joke. She said, if you start dating someone and you feel like they're boring, just take a, take a step and, and think before you say he's too boring and understand that it's security and your body is like physically craving all of this, like, Bruh! and so take a, take a deep breath. And, you know, I'm, I'm 38. He's, he's uh, 43. He's divorced. He's got some kids. I'm divorced. I've got some kids and it just, you know, we live in the same city and we started dating in COVID. So it was, I hate to use the word boring. I don't find him boring, but it was boring in comparison because you can't go anywhere. Um, So our dates were always just kind of hanging out. Um, but everything moved at a pace that was healthy. Like nothing happened too fast. Mm. Everything felt like it clicked when it was supposed to, it wasn't a whirlwind romance. And I was actually talking to a girlfriend of mine who had a toxic relationship, not abusive. And she said with him, it was whirlwind passionate romance in the beginning. And she's with someone now where it's less of that, but it feels safe, secure, and healthy. And I feel the exact same way. That's what you want. And when you take the time, like, no, I didn't follow the no kissing for three months rule. However, I took things at a much slower pace. And that's how I know that he's a great person. And I believe in great men. And I know, I mean, my account in particular, and probably yours too, I see on your account, um, you, you probably get pegged as a man hater because you have this rule. You're, you're teaching women to not give men sex. How dare you? Right. I love when you get called frigid and like uh, cold and sex. I literally, I'm like, you don't know her at uh-huh. all. You clearly don't follow her. She is yeah. not what you think she is. Um, I didn't, I never thought you were cold or frigid, obviously, but I remember the first video I saw of yours where you were like, I'm an ex stripper and I this, and I was like, oh my God, binge, binge all her videos. Now. Love it. <laughs> 
Yeah. It was just, you know, it's yeah. teaching women to have boundaries doesn't mean that we hate men. I think mm-hmm. I make videos actually that there are great men. There are so many great men. We're just yeah. not looking and we are blinded or clouded by a lot of that physical chemistry that can happen. And if you're so like, oh, I want to kiss him. You're not talking. You're missing who are you as a person. And as you always say, if you are interested in a fun relationship, then skip all you want. But it's, it's the women who are looking for a partner that need to slow down. Especially if your luck or intuition has not been working in the past. It's all the more reason to, to listen to this kind of advice. I totally agree. And I know, I mean, for me, I've only been in one abusive relationship and then one that was toxic, quite toxic, but not abusive. And before that I had, you know, a couple of healthy relationships that just didn't work out. So it's not really a pattern per se for me. Um, Mm -hmm. but it, it hits you from, you know, a direction that you just honestly weren't expecting when you allow yourself to move that fast, not to say that if you move fast, you're with a narcissistic abuser, but it is how you get into that. Because narcissistic abusers only know how to move fast. Yeah. They have one yeah. speed. It's how yeah. you can fall into the wrong relationship. Yeah. You're already feeling, you know, I think back to that first three months, particularly with your rule of, of no kissing for three months. And I think back, if we hadn't kissed in the first three months, if we hadn't said, I love you, if we weren't already freaking living together, what would I have learned? How, how much differently would I have felt Um, when I saw the red flags and I did see red flags, Mm. would I have pushed past them or, because I sort of felt like, well, we're already living together. So I'll work that out. I'll, 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 I'll see if I can help him with that. As opposed to like, that's not my job to help you with that. That's your job to, in three months, you don't know someone you really don't. And I was so committed that I was willing to overlook insane things in that first three months. Yeah. No more, no more. Um, it'll, and I know that, you know, I expect that my relationship uh, that I'm in now will work out. And I, I, we both feel that way, but just, you know, God forbid, um, I would never put up with what I put up with from my ex-husband ever again, because I've learned and I, I understand it. And, you know, I talk to clients a lot about the red flags after the relationship is over, you're done. And people say, I just didn't see him for who he was. But if you really stop and think and really reflect on the beginning of that relationship, I bet you that you will see a lot of red flags that you missed because I would tell people, you know, how long did it take for the the mask to slip off? I would say seven years, but I now realize it was probably three to six months and I just didn't see it at the time, but I sort of willfully didn't see it. And now I see it. So if I see red flags, it's, you know hold on here. And I'm looking for patterns. It's not like, uh, I don't teach people that one red flag is cut them off immediately. It's sort of put it in your pocket and Mm -hmm. see if it becomes a pattern because, you know, one, one big red flag I always talk about is, um, my ex is crazy when they speak so poorly or anything similar, but you know, they're speaking so poorly of their ex. Some people have a crazy ex. I mean, I have, (laughs) I have a crazy ex. Um, but the question is, am I talking about that on a first date, on a second date? Am I, am I using time with a new person to slander my ex? Mm. It's the red flag is not that the ex was crazy. It's that they are using time to get to know you by slandering their ex. Right. So right. if, if, if they say like, Oh, it didn't work out. She was crazy. And it never comes up again. Maybe not a red flag, but if they're kind of talking about that, or, you know, their mother is crazy, their boss is a jerk, and it just, the blame, the accountability isn't there. Um, That becomes the red flag of of slandering other people. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I love this. I love this. This has been so educational. Um, I'm, I'm super happy you came and did this with me today, because you know, my followers love my podcast and I know they're going to love you. So again, on TikTok, underscore stronger, underscore then, underscore before, where else can people find you? Um, I have a Facebook group, which is a private group that you can access through my website, strongerthanbefore.ca, um, specifically for survivors of narcissistic abuse, if you're in the relationship or out of it. Um, I also wrote um, a trauma bond recovery journal that's available on Amazon. And uh, I also 
uh, wrote a course called the Trauma Bond Recovery Course. So the short of it is it's a 12-week course teaching you all the things you need to know to get out of a relationship like that. And again, if you're out of the relationship already, but you still feel kind of stuck and you're thinking about your ex and you're still sad, uh, the course is for people who are both in the relationship and out of it. Um, and it's very affordable, but that's available on my website as well, stronger than awesome. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate your time so, so much. My pleasure. It was nice to meet you in person and, uh, or as in person as we can. And yeah. I'll definitely keep following you on TikTok. Definitely keep following you on TikTok, my love. Thanks so much. Good. I'll Bye. see you soon. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.